So my dad was a sponsor on this car back in the 60s. Supercharged Viper engines with pro chargers on them. There'd be about 2,500 horsepower per engine. Why do we do that? I don't know. You know, I wish my younger son would have told his brother, hey, I don't like how you're driving. Let me out of the car. Would have, you know, would have changed things. We're here with former top fuel racer, Doug Herbert, in his personal garage. And he's got some pretty cool projects in there. What do you got going on these days? You know, unfortunately not doing much top fuel racing these days. So uh, been working on a project to go to the Bonneville Salt Flats and set the world land speed records. Pretend we didn't just walk in here 30 seconds ago and then come back <laughs> out here to record this intro. <laughs> Doug Herbert's dad, Chet Herbert, was actually kind of like one of the founding fathers of hot riding back in early days of Southern California. He's credited with bringing the roller cam to the aftermarket industry. The first car that legendary engine builder Ed Pink, we did a video with him, he talked about going to Bonneville for the first time with a borrowed engine. That engine was from Chet Herbert. I had no idea until we had talked to Doug about this after the fact, and it's pretty cool. Very small world. So, you know, everybody's got to have a Viper in their garage, especially when they have a race car that has Viper engine in it. Yes, yeah, so we got the Viper, we got an old Cadillac, just because I, I don't know, I, I just thought it was fun. They're cool. Yeah, that's yeah, it's just cool. neat. It's fun, that old Cadillac driving down the road or at a stop line, it doesn't matter. They're, you know, an old person, a young person, uh, they're white or black or, or Spanish or whatever. Everybody's like, cool car, you know, it just kind of... It just makes people smile, I think, old cars in general. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty fun. And we got an old Top Fuel car. It's a 1964 uh, Top Fuel dragster that was ran, you know, back, back in the day. The wind spoiler, so it's kind of a neat old car. Uh, but it starts up and cackles and makes, you know, makes flames and all that. It's pretty cool. And then we got our, what we're calling the beast here, the, the uh, Bonneville car. The, Planning on going setting the world land speed record with this thing. Supercharged Viper engines with pro chargers on them. There'd be about 2,500 horsepower per engine. So two dual engines, 5,000 horsepower. It's a four wheel drive car. It'll weigh probably around 7,000 pounds uh, once it's completed. Really low coefficient of drag. And uh, you know, should be, engineering says we're gonna go over 500 miles now. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Started this project in 2008. My two boys got killed in a car crash. And the previous summer, the boys spent the summer with my dad. Uh, he's lived out in California. I grew up in California. He, my dad lived in California. So he's like, send the boys out. I want to I want to get to know them, right? Because they live in North Carolina and I'm here. So I sent out, I sent them out there and they spent a few weeks with my dad. And dad had a great time. And uh, when we lost the boys, it really, you know, it was, it was really tough on him. Tough on everybody, but it was tough on my dad. I called him and I said, hey, let's start a project together. You know, let's do something. He goes, well, what do you think? And I said, why don't you go come to the races with me and we'll run, we'll run another car. We'll run two top field cars. You can, he goes, ah, I, he says, I have no interest in top field cars. He said, you guys are, you know, they're all the same nowadays. Like back when he raced them in the 50s and 60s, everything was so different. You know, they were, you could come back and have a two wheel drive car, a four wheel drive car, two engines or whatever. Like it was all kind of crazy stuff. And he goes, nope, they're all the same. It's a bunch of cookie cutters. I don't care about that. So I was kind of thinking about what to do. And I watched this movie, The World's Fastest Indian, with Anthony Hopkins. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, World's Fastest Indian. It's a pretty good movie. You actually, you should watch it. If you're, you know, you guys are car people, right? So The World's Fastest Indian. Watch the movie, and at the end of the movie, I called my dad. I go, Dad, I know we got to build a Bonneville car. We got to go to Bonneville. And uh, my dad had had some pretty good success at Bonneville over the years. He goes, well, what, kind of, what, you know, what class are you thinking? I said, you know, World's Fastest Car. We're going we're gonna to build a, you know, world's fastest car, the fastest streamliner. And he goes, well, now that'd be something I'd be interested in. So we started working on the project and we were hitting it pretty hard. Um, and right after I started on it, uh, Ray Abraham's a buddy of mine. Ray came by the shop and he's like, what are you, what are you building here? Because I had the differentials and some of the part. And he goes, that thing, I can't, I don't, I've never seen anything like that. And he goes, no, it's, we're building a car to go to Bonneville, set the world land speed record. And Ray goes, well, I'd be interested in helping on that. And so then Ray got involved on the body design and doing uh, solid model works and, and doing, uh, you know, electric, you know, wind tunnel testing, that kind of stuff. And so Ray's engineers helped with that. Is that and, when you still had the race team? Yep. Yeah, in, in 08. So we were hitting it really hard trying to uh, trying to get the car done for 09, for Speed Week in 09. And so it's coming together pretty quick. And about that same time, my dad got sick and ended up passing away. And Ray's dad got sick and passed away. So it was kind of like we were really pushing hard to get it done because we wanted to go do this with our dads. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, life went on and we had other projects that we, you know, that we were involved with. And so it just kind of got put on the back burner. A year or two ago, I decided, you know what? I got to get the car done. Is it was the car was actually sitting over in Mike Wallace's shop, 
and uh, he goes, when are you going to get that thing done? So he, Mike kind of jump-started me to get the car done. And then we built this garage so that I had a place to work on it. What was the fastest you went in a top fuel car? Uh, just over 330. But, you know, it's a different, right? You go zero to 330 in four seconds where this thing, a run, you know, that 500 mile an hour run will be about 100 seconds. So it'll be like a, a five mile drag race basically is what we're going to do with this thing. So pretty, it'll be pretty cool, pretty exciting. You know, even going 330 miles an hour, you don't have much time to look around and think, man, we're going fast. So I'm hoping going 500, I'll have time to at least go, this thing is hauling ass, you know? <laughs> One thing I noticed in there was the seat. How... Well, first of all, I have, I don't know if you noticed, I have my camera on extendo mode right now because normally when we talk to people, I can hold the GoPro sort of at like a 90 degree arm level because everybody's shorter than yeah. me. I'm but, your height. Yeah, you're my height. So I'm holding this thing up here and it's kind of like, this is uncomfortable for my arm. So I pulled up the little, the little thing. Well, the seat is definitely not made for comfort. Uh, the one, you know, the seat's not finished, obviously. We're, it'll be poured, so it'll have a... You know, it'll have a poured seat in it that'll be fitted, uh, you know, for safety. But, uh, you know, it's really, it's really laying down. This obviously will be trimmed about the same height here. Um, but it's, you're basically laying down with your head tilted up a little bit. Because the whole car off the ground is only, uh, the top of the body is about 24 inches. The top of the canopy will be about a little over 30 inches. So uh, the whole car is only 28 inches wide. Uh, so it's basically like a bullet, right? 5,000 horsepower to go 500 miles an hour. What kind of gear ratio do you have to do that? We've actually had special differentials made. They're a 133 ring and pinion, but they're uh, quick chain style. So we're we're gonna pl we're planning on running about a one to one ratio. Hmm. Uh, you know, so it'll be it'll be uh, we've got it figured that roughly a little over 6,000, maybe 6,500 RPM should be 500 miles an hour. Interesting. So if you have one engine running each set of wheels yep. if one engine has a problem will there be like an electronic fail safe to cut the other one so you're not like uh you don't no, get out of no. whack i mean it you know if something happens to one engine it'll probably just shut it, you know that's when we depend on the driver to make okay. sure you just shut it <laughs> off because you're not going to set any records on one engine yeah so yeah i'll probably just shut it off at that point i would think and, and nothing to hit <laughs> right that's the good thing about bonneville is you know I mean, even drag racing, NASCAR, whatever, right? It's the speed is not what hurts you. It's those sudden stops. You know, yeah. the sudden stops are what gets you. Well, the thing about Bonneville is there's nothing out there, right? It's a it's a national park. It's a huge open space. So, you know, the only thing really bad that could possibly happen is maybe doing a barrel roll in this thing. But as far as but there's really not enough traction to kind of get it hooked up. So you're you know you're more than likely you're just going to skid around. It's not going to you know because the tires are pretty hard and uh not a lot of traction there and and so you know you're you're, you're probably going to be skidding around rather than hitting something if you get out of whack you throw the parachute and hopefully it's yeah right throw out. the parachute and pulls the car you know pulls the car straight really you know that's the idea so this car will have three parachutes on it uh the 500 mile an hour chute is only about a six foot canopy and then 400 mile an hour chute's about a uh a little bit bigger, I think it's about an eight foot canopy, and then the 300 chute is like a regular top field dragster parachute, like you know, pretty big. You gotta but, start small so it doesn't just get ripped off. It doesn't rip the, yeah, it doesn't <laughs> rip the shoot off, exactly. Yeah, it doesn't rip the shoot off. What are some of the construction details that you can um, explain on this? Well, one of the neat things, and we found this out doing the, doing the uh, wind tunnel work. Originally, we were going to run the exhaust out the side, which obviously would be a lot easier. The, the drag, at, it was about 450 miles an hour. The drag from the exhaust coming out was actually slowing the car down because the exhaust is coming out slower than what the car is going. So it's actually, actually you're pushing that through the air. So bringing the exhaust out the back of the car was a big deal. It, it was a, a huge benefit on, on uh, aerodynamics, bringing, the fuel, bringing that out the back. So basically, there'll be three parachutes mounted back here the exhaust is coming out the back uh vertical fin on the car we were pretty careful about doing the uh wheel well so these are they're like eighth inch steel all around the tires because what we didn't want to happen is have tires start coming apart and then it you know disintegrates the car like a top fuel car you have a tire come off and takes your wing off you're gonna crash so 
uh, these eighth inch steel wheel wells we we're hoping are going to contain anything if the tire starts to come apart um, so that'll be a pretty good thing obviously you know fire systems for the engines fire system for the driver area and then we got you know, a couple nitrous bottles in case we only go 499 miles an hour we can push the button for a little bit more uh, so that, that should be pretty good because the exhaust coming out even though it's it's aired it the way I've heard it explained is it almost acts like a solid object exactly. outside the car yep. where like, I don't know, did you ever do this with your top fuel testing where, where you would take like cones and the rough shape of what the exhaust would come out of yep. out of the header and run it in the wind tunnel like that? Yep. Well, it's, and it's hard because on the, on the top fuel cars, there's the amount of downforce. You've got like 300 or 3000 pounds of downforce coming out the exhaust on a top fuel car. Cause they're just, they move such a huge amount of air. Hmm. So it's, it's a big, you know, the header angles and all kinds of stuff on top field guards are critical. Will this be one pipe for each engine? Nope, one pipe for the left side, one pipe for the right side. Oh. We got them, we kind of got them wide together. Uh, these ProFab guys made the, made the exhaust. So they're pretty neat, uh, pretty neat exhaust. You know, they're all, you know, merge collector. Like they're a pretty neat, uh, you know, they're a really neat design. Um, but they're, uh, you know, so that basically it'll go from one engine will merge into the second engine so we'll have 10 cylinders going out each side going out through the back hmm. so you know 20 cylinders total 10 cylinders coming out each side pro charger has been pretty helpful on this project all along and so we've got these uh big superchargers on here they'll make you know we should be able to make that 2500 horsepower without a whole lot of trouble hopefully here in the next few weeks we're gonna we're gonna be doing some uh, we've got one engine over ready to run in the dyno now so these are just mock-up stuff in here since you started this such a long time ago, all like engine technology, pro charger technology, fuel injection, yep. all that stuff has progressed so much since 2008. Were there any components that you had that you were like, wow, these are obsolete now and then replace them? Yep. Well, pro chargers came up with better impellers, you know, make more power and less heat. Um, we were going to run five speed transmissions. Now we've got these Liberty seven speed transmissions going in the car. They're electronically shifted. So that's pretty neat. As far as the engine parts, not a lot of different there. Uh, this, the ring technology has gotten a lot better in the last few years, so we've got different uh, rings. Uh, the, you know, we work with Total Seal uh, for a long time on the rings, so we've got uh, we've got some better rings there for the sealing. You know, billet crankshafts and curler rods and you know, coated pistons and um, everything's still probably pretty close to to what it was even back then just the ring technology has definitely gotten better so we we've got different rings uh, piston rings in it for now but other than that man everything about pretty close to the same um uh, what fuel injection system are you gonna run uh we got a uh, motec stuff for it yeah so the motec is pretty neat because it'll be you know display for the driver also uh synchronizing the engines together doing traction control doing all the uh, all the data collection, ride heights, and all that kind of stuff. So it's a lot of, there'll be a lot of data to analyze after a run. You know, on a top fuel car, you've got four seconds of data to analyze. Now we're gonna have a, roughly 100 seconds of data to analyze on this thing. So hopefully we'll be smart enough to analyze all that data and know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so is the entire body gonna be carbon fiber? Mm -hmm. or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That'll be cool. Do you know like, like a rough estimate of what the weight will be? car should be ready to race about 7,000 pounds. So pretty heavy, yeah, yeah, pretty heavy. We're just getting the, uh, the tank finished for the front. I can't remember, I think it's about an 80 gallon tank that'll be in the front for cooling. Uh, obviously it'll just be recirculating. At the end of the run, we can, we're gonna dump the water out, uh, spray it on the engines and kind of cool them down so that we get back to the kitchen. It'll be cool enough, we can hopefully work on them. Uh, and then, uh, Methanol, the engines are going to run on methanol. We chose methanol because they're kind of, it'll, it should keep things cooler. It'll keep the air charge a little bit cooler going in because we just don't have enough room to put intercoolers on there. So uh, the engines won't be intercooled. They'll just be supercharged with running on methanol. Ray Ringham helped a lot on the suspension. Obviously, he's a suspension, you know, guru. And uh, so he's actually helped a lot on the suspension and watch links and all that kind of cool stuff that, you know, I'm an old drag racer. I didn't know about that. So <laughs> it was neat to have race help uh, on that part for sure. Yeah, so the air engines go in here and uh, they're kind of a structural part also. Oh. And then they're going to go, you know, out of each of these pipes, they'll be ducted around to go into the superchargers. 
thing's built really, really strong. Um, but all the weight's down pretty low. We wanted to, you know, we wanted all the weight to be really low on the car. This this whole section here on bolts, so that we can we can uh, take this section of the of the frame off and be able to work on the engines. Hmm. You know, just my previous experience working on top field cars, we need to be able to work on the engines. We don't want to go to Bonneville and burn a piston or something. And, oh yeah, let's come back. You know, next year we want to be able to put a new piston in and go back out and run it. You know, run the engine again. What kind of trailer do you put this in? <laughs> well, <laughs> if you're the kind of person who likes racing and cars and NASCAR. I'm gonna go on a limb and say when you pull up to your house, you like seeing a nice green lawn. And if you don't have a nice green lawn, you probably want one. Well, today's sponsor can help you get that figured out with the minimal amount of effort and research on your part, which I know is important. Sunday is a subscription service that combines unique data with cutting edge science to help you grow a better, greener lawn with mystery free ingredients like seaweed, molasses, and iron. And uses soil, climate, and satellite data to model your lawn and build a custom plan just for your lawn. They'll also analyze the results of your personal soil test to zero in on any deficiencies and update your plan from there. Because you gotta have the right dirt to grow the right grass. All you gotta do is getsunday.com forward slash Stapleton. You can find the link down there. You type in your address to get your lawn analysis. You get your customized lawn care plan in seconds. Everything gets sent right to your doorstep when you need it. You receive customized shipments throughout the year to keep your lawn looking fresh. Here in North Carolina, we have red clay. It's very different from where I grew up in Pennsylvania and probably different from where you are. And unless you're a farmer or something, you probably don't know what the right balance of nutrients is in your dirt to grow the right kind of grass. You might just be buying bags of stuff at the store that aren't actually gonna help you and Sunday solves that problem. Go to GetSunday.com slash Stapleton and use promo code STAPLETON20 to get 20% off your custom lawn care plan. Yeah, so there lies a story. Uh, when you guys were up at Poncho Weaver's the other day, Poncho's building a trailer that'll have four swing arms on it. So it'll be a, 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 a four-wheel trailer with swing arms on it. So it'll have airbags drop down on the ground because the clearance, the ground clearance is only an inch on this thing. So we'll drop down on the ground, we'll have an inch, the car will roll on the trailer and then the airbags will lift it up and then off we go. <laughs> That's guess it's gotta be a long trailer. It'll be a pretty long trailer, yeah. <laughs> and then to go to Bonneville, we'll probably put that trailer on a semi-trailer or something like that. But that trailer, will work, we'll use it for uh, towing the car around in the pits. And uh, you know, if we have to tow it around Charlotte area to go get some work done or whatever, you know, we'll probably, uh, carbon shop to finish up the body or you know whatever we need to do there that makes yeah. sense who made the carbon on here um, the, the body work that we've got so far uh, uh, Gunther Steiner actually did the body work on it huh. did the, kind of did, figured did that he would stuff. be like the guru for that yeah Gunther did it and then you know Gunther obviously I don't know what he's doing now but he's been pretty busy with his Formula One stuff so uh, we're trying to figure out who's going to uh, help us get the rest of the body finished. So that that needs to start happening pretty quick. If we're going to run the car this year, we got to get on that. So that's like that's a so the big thing is to get that trailer done so that we can get the car over to the carbon shop and start getting that body you know getting the body panels done. Hmm. The hardest part probably is going to be the canopy because that's the one that's got the most shapes and curves and all that. Um, so the canopy, well, you can see that uh, rendering up there. That's what the canopy looks like. So be, you know, that's going to be pretty. Where's the render at? Right here. Gunther doesn't work for the F1 team anymore, so maybe. He yeah, so maybe he's got some time. <laughs> yeah. Didn't call me. Hadn't called me. Uh, returned my call the last couple of times, so maybe he'll call me back now that he's not so busy. We saw him at Costco a couple months ago. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. It's kind of funny, Costco is like, you never know who you're going to see. We've seen Larry Mack there, we've seen him yeah. there. It's like, where's the butter? Oh, there's Larry Mack. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. I saw Larry there too. Uh, who else? <laughs> uh, I think we've gosh. seen Larry there twice. Yeah. Obviously, this car is a pretty expensive car to build. So if any of the people watching your podcast uh, are interested in being involved with the car, come out with us, go to Bonneville. Hey, if you want to buy a set of tires or... Or uh, you know, help be a sponsor in some way. We're we're looking for people that would love to do that and be part of uh, be a part of history. You know, world's fastest car doesn't happen every day. How would they contact you for that? Uh, go to my website is uh, dougherbert.com or my email address is real easy. It's just dh at dougherbert.com. So send me an email. 
did you have a hard time fitting in the top fuel car back then? So most of those guys are like jockeys, <laughs> right. you know, it's... Well, you know, all of my cars were made for me. So I had uh, either Swindle, Al Swindle built my cars for years, and then we switched over to uh, Merck McKinney. But I would go to their shop and I'd sit in the car and they'd build the car around me. So it's like getting a custom pair of shoes made, hmm. you know, so the cars... Uh, Kenny Bernstein wouldn't go sit in my car. He couldn't sit with the steering wheel, you know. <laughs> so it was, you know, everybody's all the cars were kind of made specifically for the drivers. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But was it all well, before you had the luxury? So you could of, fit in one of my top fuel cars. Yeah, I could. I, <laughs> I couldn't fit in anybody else's though. Like, That's right. Before you had cars that were able to be built for you, did you have a hard like to make modifications to yeah. somebody's old chassis or something like that yep. to wedge yeah, My first in top there? fuel car was miserable. Like I didn't fit in it. Wasn't comfortable in it. And never won any races then either because it's hard to win a race when you're not comfortable driving the car. You can't, can't do a good job driving. So I figured out it was the, the Mongoose, the Tom McEwen, the Mongoose is the one that told me, he goes, Dougie, you got to go get a car built for you. You're, once you do that, it'll change everything. And he was right. As soon as the second year of racing, I had a car built for me, like we started winning right off the bat, which is, it was just all the difference in the world. Just having, the being fit comfortable. Of, like not fitting in the car kind of like make you not want to race anymore? No, because my desire to race was so strong. I thought, I don't, you know, it's like no pain, no gain, right? I want to figure yeah. this out. But as soon as I got in a car that was comfortable, I was like, okay, this is so much easier to focus on driving the car because I'm not thinking about being uncomfortable. Even though you're really not thinking about it when you're driving, so, you know, in your mind, you just, you know, it just it's just uncomfortable, right? You're crashed in and you can't see that good, you can't you can't move around. Yeah, it's yeah. miserable. Did you ever like think about doing any other forms of racing? Uh, I did. I raced some uh, late models and some modifieds down at uh, New Smyrna Beach. Wow. Yeah, had fun doing that. I and, didn't know that. Uh, That's cool. Yeah, had some fun doing that. Because when I moved here, old crew chief for uh, Hendrix, Richard Broom, I never knew him, Richard. Richard was like, Rick Hendricks, one of his first employees back when he first started racing, before he even raced NASCAR, he was racing drag boats. And Richard was the crew chief on the boats and then got, you know, they got into obviously big time NASCAR. But uh, when I first moved here in 1989, Richard told me, son, you need to get rid of that top field car and build your circle track car. And so that was why I, you know, I kind of got into it a little bit, but there's just nothing more fun than driving a top fuel car like driving a top fuel car is fun and it, they've changed a lot now right there's you know the parachutes come out automatically the, all this stuff it's like well what happened to the driver so i think it's changed a little bit you know but uh, you know obviously you know i still have a lot of friends that do it and and they still love it but even they'd be the first to say yeah it's kind of like it's not as much about skill anymore Things have changed. I mean, I, I though don't get me wrong. I mean, there's still plenty, of, you know, plenty of skill involved, but it's not so much reliant on the driver as it was. And a lot of that is because safety, right? Yeah. You know, my friend Scott Coletta got killed in the car, and, and then they're like, okay, we got to change something. And so they, you know, they they went from a quarter mile track to a thousand foot track. That was because that was the easiest way to slow them down. Well, now they're back up to going 340 miles an hour. What's your tie to the your dad and? this car um so my dad was a sponsor on this car back in the 60s and uh just uh you know i've always been a big fan i mean these just you know top fuel cars just look these top fuel cars they're just that's just so cool right i mean you know these old guys back in the 50s and 60s well they were young guys back in the 50s and 60s right you go to a junkyard and find an old desoto or an old chrysler 300 or something and pull the engine out and uh, you'd go put a Chet Herbert cam in the thing and hop it up and get a supercharger. And the next thing you know, you're racing at Lions Drag Strip. You know, they're just, you could build a car in a week for a couple thousand bucks and, uh, and go have some fun and, and go fast. Where that is, you know, because basically there's nothing to it except for a powerful engine. And I don't know, there's just something cool about it. And, you know, just the cackle, a nitro, nothing sounds quite like a nitro engine. They just, they make, a noise like no other engine makes you know have you guys heard nitro engines running yeah mm. i mean they're like that sounds pretty cool <laughs> i've always been addicted to that sound you know and uh, so this car runs and drives and stuff i'm too big to fit in you'd fit in it fine you, you should hop in there <laughs> oh that's one of the ones with the oh god yeah, that makes me cringe looking yeah. at that get yeah. that rear yeah, end that i hope that doesn't blow apart. Uh, no you're screwed the are in trouble yeah 
These are a little tight jeans. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Can you imagine going 220 miles an hour in that car? No. Because you, know, you can't really see where you're going. You got your handbrake and your parachute lever and your fuel shut off. And like it's a, you know, and these tires here, back in the day that, you know, they'd have the tread come off the tire and it comes and whacks you in the head. You know, yeah. They're, they're, I mean, you were, you were pretty tough to race these cars. That'd be pretty tough. But they're, you know, they're neat, right? You just look at them and they look like a hot rod. And so the thing is cool. like, you know, like your rear end being at your crotch or like, right. you know, you have like your drive shaft brakes and just, you know. You're in big trouble. That's right. <laughs> I couldn't wear a helmet in here. Well, there's a seat pad in there. You take the seat pad out and you you would sit down a little bit lower. <laughs> cool. Yeah, this, you know, pretty neat. So I've got, I've got a, a drum of nitro over here and so we can, we can uh, put a little bit of nitro in the tank and cackle it off and it's pretty fun. Is that how you got into drag racing was your dad was making cams yeah yeah so my dad was in the cam business and uh so he knew you know all those guys and i remember going to orange county international raceway when i was a kid and and uh seeing big daddy don garlis you know like wow big daddy don garlis my dad knew him so that was so cool and uh, i got to sit in big daddy's car you know and i was thinking man one of these days i'm gonna be able to race big daddy and like I mean, it was a dream come true right i got to race big daddy i got to race shirley i got to race the mongoose i got to race the snake you know all the people that were my heroes growing up i had a chance to race and connie Colletta, uh you know the list is you know some pretty pretty neat right mm -hmm. uh, you know chris caramacini's all the guys that i've watched racing growing up i got you know i got into it early enough where i was still able to race those guys so it was pretty yeah, it's pretty fun so you were kind of in that that intermediate era where you were at the tail end of the the pioneers and sort of the beginning of the modern yeah. age yeah you're really right yeah that's yeah. interesting i started racing so my first i had a top alcohol dragster in 1985 i raced the alcohol cars until 1990 and then 1991 started with top fuel and then raced full-time top fuel until 2008 and then i kept racing a little bit my last race was at bristol in uh 2014. Oh wow. You want to explain a little bit about brakes and what you're doing now? Yeah, so you know in 2008, I mean obviously I love cars and you know my kids got killed in a car crash less than a mile from my house. So I, um, my thinking was okay well I need to do something to teach these kids about being safe drivers and there's a place to go fast right to go to a racetrack that's where you go faster a go-kart track or whatever there's plenty of places to go fast but the street's not you know, it's not one of those places mm -hmm. and i think my son you know right we were all 17 before too and you know when you're 17 you just kind of don't think you know nothing's ever going to happen to me i'm bulletproof and you know everything's but it's really not that way and i did not know at the time that uh, car crash is the number one cause of fatalities for teenagers so i thought okay i'm going to teach i'm going to get a group of my driving friends together law enforcement whatever uh get a get some trainers together and teach these teenagers about being safer drivers so in 2008 we trained like 50 kids that were all friends of my kids and i thought man pretty cool you know we've got these 50 kids trained and it was kind of rewarding to to be able to accomplish that goal and then uh I had parents call me and saying, hey, I, you know, I got another kid coming along. When are you going to do another class? Okay, well, we'll do another class. So did another class. And then every time we did a class, I had more people calling me, wanting me to do more. And, uh, you know, so it was just, it was kind of my therapy, really. You know, so I'm, I was paying to do these classes and put everything together. And then uh, it, it, uh, another friend of mine said, hey, you've got the perfect opportunity to create a charity in memory of your kids like what's better and uh, so my boy's friends came up with this name breaks be responsible and keep everyone safe and so since then we've started training we've got uh, uh vehicle support uh, initially was rick hendrick uh, gave me cars to use to train the kids and then we got kia stepped up and now we have three fleets of kia vehicles that run around the country every weekend have classes in different cities um, so we hit a lot of times we'll have three different cities running with classes in the weekend and we've trained over 150,000 teenagers all around the country. So it's pretty neat. That's really cool. Um, pretty cool to know that we're really making a difference. We have the uh, University of North Carolina does our data collection, analyzation, and uh, they did a five-year study that showed these kids that we're training are actually 64% less likely to be involved in a car crash after they go through the class. So it's, it's pretty neat. We're teaching them driving skills but i think one of the most important things we're teaching them is making good decisions you know like 
like, have you guys ever been in a in a car driving with somebody and felt uncomfortable with the yeah. way they're driving? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody has, right? Yeah. And why do we do that? I don't know. You know, I wish my younger son would have told his brother, hey, I don't like how you're driving. Let me out of the car. Would have, you know, would have changed things. And so that's one of the things we tell people is, hey, make a good decision. If you're in a bad place, change where you are, you know, get out of the car. And if you're embarrassed and you say, hey, I think I'm sick, I might throw up. Car pulls over really quick. Nobody wants you to get sick in their car. So, uh, you know, we kind of give them some tools and make them think about making good decisions. In addition to skills in the car, you know, about distractions and uh, wheel drop off, you know, recovery back on the road. Uh, we put skid, uh, these basically like big wheel tires on the cars to teach them about uh, how to avoid a skid, how to get out of a skid, you know, because they, right, you read in the book, oh, steering to the skid, well, what do you do then? You know, how, what does that even mean? So we're putting them in the cars and putting them through this experience and giving them some experience. Uh, analog braking, a- activating the analog brakes so you know what it feels like, right? It shakes the car, it feels weird. Um, gosh, what other, uh, we do a slalom course, we do an emergency lane change course. Um, you know, basically we just, we look at what are causing the crashes and then we come up with exercises to teach kids how to avoid those bad situations. So yeah, it's pretty neat. So it started out for a, you know, trying to teach my kids friends and it's kind of snowballed into a big thing. Where can people go if they want to send their kid through that course? Uh, put on the brakes.org. Put on the brakes.org is, uh, we've got, uh, safe driving contracts on there. If you can't even get to a class, at least talk to your teenagers about being safe drivers and and not riding with somebody that's being a knucklehead, right? We all had knucklehead friends. They're the most fun, but they're also the ones that you probably don't want to be in the car driving with them. Yeah, that's interesting. I was usually the driver. Maybe some, <laughs> maybe some people said that about me, but I felt like I was okay. <laughs> you were in control. Yeah, I'd go do dumb stuff on purpose when I was by myself, so like I could test the test the skid or yeah. what happens if you pull the e brake in the middle of the highway or you know do that at three in the morning when nobody's out there i did stuff like that right but and i think it helped me people probably thought it was stupid but i was like i want to know what this does so i can feel, like feel it well i mean the roads have changed right since in the last 20 30 years there was there's more traffic now uh, you know cars are different right it used to be you had to pump the brakes well now there's analog like brakes so you don't really do that and then it used to be a horn button in the center of the steering wheel now it's an airbag that comes out at 200 miles an hour so things have just changed and we actually require the parents to come through the course too. Uh, Kia provides vehicles for us and then Kia uh, gives us a set of vehicles for the parents too. So we have instructors for the parents because teenagers don't necessarily learn all these bad habits on their own. Yeah. Been, they've been watching <laughs> us drive for a long time. So you know a lot of the bad habits come from the parents who so are kind of coaching the parents up because it's been you know 20 or 30 years since parents have taken any driver's ed. And I mean, yeah. my driver's ed when I was a kid was, you know, the PE teacher driving you around to pick up his dry cleaning and the laundry <laughs> you know, stuff. I mean, it was like, you know, it was not, not really serious. It was just getting a little bit of experience. So the, there's a lot of adults that need that class that live here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's a yeah. very good point. It's like, we're going to pretend it's for the kids, but it's really for you. <laughs> crazy <laughs> people. We, yeah. It's hard to raise a good parent, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> Doug is a really cool guy. And we really admire that he was able to find a way to turn his pain into a purpose and be productive and provide value to the world through that. I I would highly recommend checking this out if you have kids or nieces or nephews or if you're one of the parents that should probably go through this course, you could do it yourself. <laughs> I know most of you are older than me. I'm 27, so you, you maybe you do have kids. I don't know. If you enjoyed this video, if you enjoyed other videos we've made too, make sure you're subscribed. It doesn't barrage you with notifications or anything. Heck, it'll barely give you any, maybe none. But what that does is if YouTube knows that you like our stuff, when you log into YouTube and it has the page with all the stuff on it, when you open it, our stuff is more likely to be on there. So when we post something new, you'll see it, you can watch it, you can leave a comment, we'll answer you, everybody's best friends. And if you like the hat and shirt I was wearing in the video, you can find those at staplesonautoworks.com. It's kind of like a vintage Stavola Brothers style hat. We got them in black and red. We got them in black, red. We got a good wrench vibe thing going on here. And Logan will yell at me if I unfold these, but that's the shirt I was wearing. Uh, this matches that. I'm wearing the Lake Speed shirt right now, which are these ones. Whatever we have on the shelf is all we have. So if you if your size is in stock, it might not be forever. And go on the channel and scroll way back to older videos. I bet there's a bunch on there that you haven't seen before that you'd really enjoy.